This is the eighth video in my Targaryen King series, in which I explain and analyze the reigns of each king in the Targaryen dynasty. Up until this point, from Aegon the Conqueror through the regency of Aegon III, almost all the information has come from Fire and Blood, an in-depth, Targaryen-specific fake history book. But now we've reached Daron the first king whose reign is only covered in the World of Ice and Fire and sporadically across the A Song of Ice and Fire books. So these videos will probably become a bit shorter since we just don't know all the minute details of the rest of the king's reigns. For instance, thanks to Fire and Blood, we know that a brave, loyal hero named Dick Bean died for King Maegor. Who is Daron's Dick Bean? We'll just never know. King Daron is the eldest child of Daenerys Valerion and King Aegon III, called the Dragonbane, who I covered in my last video in this series. Aegon III had a depressing life, his formative years coming on the heels of the Dance of the Dragons. This meant that his son Daron grew up in a time of rebuilding and peace, but also a time without dragons. Aegon III died of tuberculosis in 157 AC, and his 14-year-old son Daron succeeded him as Daron I. His uncle Viserys, Aegon III's beloved brother, was Hand of the King. He could have forced a regency upon Daron until he came of age at 16, but he decided against it. He experienced firsthand what life was like as a young Targaryen manipulated by a council of regents. So he let his nephew Daron assume full responsibility as king of Westeros at the age of 14. In hindsight, this was a poor move by T. While his father wore a simple gold circlet for a crown, Daron chose the iron and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror, a symbolic bit of foreshadowing for how he intended to reign. What is that? Oh shit, what is that? Few foresaw that Daron the first of his name, would cover himself in glory, as did his ancestor, Aegon the Conqueror. Daron was determined to complete the conquest, as he put it. When Aegon and his sisters took Westeros, 157 years ago, they failed to force the submission of Dorne. The Targaryen kings went on styling themselves Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Lord of the Seven Kingdoms! Lady of the Seven Kingdoms. And King of the Roinar. And the Roinar. And the Roinar! And the Roinar! And the Roinar! Oh. Lord and Protector of the Seven Kingdoms. Nice. But in truth, Dorne remained independent. Let's briefly look at the history of relations between House Martell and House Targaryen up until this point. First, at the beginning of Aegon's conquest, Princess Maria Martell offered to join Aegon in defeating the Stormlands, but as an ally, not as Aegon's subject. He refused. His sister Rhaenys flew her dragon Meraxes to conquer Dorne, but all the Dornish fighters hid in the mountains and deserts. Maria Martell told Rhaenys, I will not fight you, nor will I kneel to you. Dorne has no king. Tell your brother that. Rhaenys said, We will come again and next time we shall come with fire and blood. Your words, said Princess Maria, ours are unbowed, unbent, unbroken. You may burn us, my lady, but you will not bend us, break us, or make us bow. This is Dorne. You are not wanted here. Return at your peril. A few years later, after the rest of Westeros was conquered, Aegon and his sisters flew south, and began the first Dornish War, which lasted nine years. They found the castles empty once again, and they thought they'd won immediately. But as soon as they left Dorne, the Martells retook Sunspear and attacked the garrisons left behind by Aegon. Lord Tyrell's entire army disappeared in the desert. So Aegon returned once more, and burned a whole lot of castles. At the Hellholt, his sister-wife Rhaenys was sniped out of the air with a scorpion bolt, killing her and her dragon Meraxes. So for two years, called the Dragon's Wrath, Aegon and Visenya unleashed Balerion and Vagar on every single castle in Dorne at least once to avenge their sister and force Dorne's submission. 
When Maria Martel finally died, her son Nymor made peace with Aegon. After this, the Targaryens and Martels actually became friends. Aegon visited Sunspear with his son Aenys, and managed to hold himself back from jacarsing it to the ground. So that's progress. <laughs> Years later, during Aenys' reign, the Targaryens fought the Vulture King, an outlaw from Dorne who commanded thousands of swords. The Martels said they did not support the Vulture King, but truthfully, they ignored him and did not help House Targaryen. Another Vulture King rose during Jaehaerys' reign, and he flew Vermithor to Dorne to deal with him. However, the Martels stayed out of it again. Later in Jaehaerys' reign, Morion Martell was butthurt about the time Jaehaerys and his army came into Dorne unimpeded to kill the Vulture King, so he was planning an invasion of Westeros. The Fourth Dornish War lasted a single day, as Jaehaerys and his sons, Aemon and Balon, burned the Martell fleet. Fast forward 74 years, and Daron the Young Dragon wants to invade Dorne again. It's free real estate. However, as his uncle Viserys reminded him, Aegon the Conqueror had three dragons, and still failed. Daron had zero, for the last Targaryen dragon died during his father's reign. To this, King Daron said, You have a dragon. He stands before you. That quote is so cool. There's just no way this could go wrong. Daron devised his war plans with Alan Valerion. He would split his force into three armies. The first would be led by Lord Lionel Tyrell, traveling through the Prince's Pass into the western Red Mountains of Dorne. The second would be led by Alan Valerion, traveling by sea. The third army would be led by Daron himself, traveling right through the Boneway, a dangerous, narrow passage easily ambushed by Dornishmen. Daron used goat tracks in the ground of the mountains to go around the Dornish watchtowers and avoid ambush. During Aegon's conquest, Oris Baratheon suffered a bad defeat in the Boneway, but Daron marched right on through. Lionel Tyrell made it safely through the Prince's Pass as well, and Alan Valerion had defeated the Planky Town and moved his force upriver. This divided the Dornish armies in half, the east and west unable to support each other. In a year's time, Daron fought his way through Dorne and arrived at the gates of Sunspear. He lost 10,000 men doing so, but in the end, he succeeded where Aegon the Conqueror failed. The unnamed Prince Martell bent the knee to Daron Targaryen at the submission of Sunspear. My desert. My Aragis. I do. Daron was a super humble king, so he wrote a whole book about his own conquest of Dorne. Mr. Pilo says he wrote with an elegant simplicity. But Doran Martell says that Daron lied about the sizes of the Dornish armies, making it sound like he defeated more men than he actually did. Daron presumably wrote this autobiography during the time he spent in Dorne to consolidate his power and deal with some rebels. One such rebel force attacked King Daron with poisoned arrows, but his cousin Prince Aemon saved Daron by taking the arrow himself. He survived, though, and went on to become Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, son of Viserys, the Hand of the King, and one of the most legendary Kingsguard in history. By 159 AC, Daron was now 16, and his conquest of Dorne was complete. Peace resumed at last. He left Lionel Tyrell in Sunspear to oversee this peace, and also took 14 noble Dornish hostages back with him to King's Landing. He even considered a betrothal between one of his sisters, Dana, Reyna, or Elena, to the Sea Lord of Bravos, believing the Bravosi could help get rid of the pirates who were harming the trade into Dorne. However, Bravos was at war with Pentos and Lys, so the other free cities were angry at the potential alliance of Bravos and the Targaryens. They began to give aid to the Dornish rebels to chip away at the Targaryen power. The noble houses of Dorne, whose sons and daughters were now hostages in the Red Keep, could no longer directly support rebellion. The common folk, however, had no such worry. Over the next three years, over 40,000 people died 
in the skirmishes between the Dornishmen and the Kingsmen who Daron left behind. Lionel Tyrell was out of his depth. He went from castle to castle to subdue the rebellions, hanging Dornishmen and burning entire villages. The small folk stole his supplies, burned his camps, and killed his horses. They killed Tyrell's men in the alleyways of Sunspear, ambushed them in the desert, and murdered them in their camps. Leaving a Tyrell as the steward of Dorne was a very bad call by Daron. Obviously, Dorne would have rebelled regardless of who Daron left in charge. But the Dornish had particular reason to hate the Tyrells. The Reach and Dorne border each other and have an ancient rivalry. The rebellion got really bad when Tyrell reached Sandstone. There, he was murdered in a bed of scorpions. With Daron Steward of Dorne now dead, open rebellion spread across the country. So in 160 AC, King Daron returned to Dorne to put down the rebels himself. Fine. I'll do it myself. He gained small victories along the Boneway, while Alan Valerion redefeated the Planky Town and moved up the Greenblood River. Daron was actually really good at fighting wars, because he didn't care about how many men he lost, or about the destruction he was causing. After a year of reconquering Dorne, the Dornish men met with King Daron to discuss terms of Dorne's surrender. However, it was murder they plotted, not peace. They attacked Daron and his men beneath a peace banner. Three knights of the King's Guard were killed, one of them Sir Olivar Oakhart, an ancestor of Sir Eris Oakhart, a Kingsguard who protects Marcella Baratheon in Dorne, and also dies in Dorne like Olivar did, except Eris got to have a sultry affair with Aragorn Martell before he died. I guess you could say Olivar Oakhart was Daron's Dick Bean, a loyal man who gave his life fighting for the king. Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight cut through two betrayers before being wounded and captured unable to save his cousin, the king. Daron I died in 161 AC, after a bloody betrayal in Dorne, with Blackfire in his hand, surrounded by a dozen enemies. In the end, Daron spent about four years as king of Westeros, from 157 to 161 AC. Only 18 years old, he never married or had any children, so the crown passed to his younger brother, Baelor who would become known as Baelor the Blessed in his own stupid reign. It appears as though the trauma Aegon III experienced led to him becoming a pretty mediocre father to Daron and Baelor, explaining why both of them suck in different ways. Daron wanted glory and victory so badly that it blinded him from seeing the truth. Doran cannot be conquered by dragons or by swords. The young dragon was a fierce warrior, and an inspiration to a young Jon Snow. But we've already seen how Jon is more pragmatic than Daron ever was. If it had been the young dragon on the wall when the wildlings attacked, he would have gotten every last man in the Night's Watch killed if it meant the wildlings could be driven back north. But Jon saw that they couldn't win with swords, so he instead made peace with words. Except Jon was apparently too unlike the young dragon so his men mutinied against him and murdered him. Not really sure what the lesson is here. Bowen Marsh sucks? In the Stormlands, the Weeping Town got its name when King Daron's corpse was sent through the town back to King's Landing. In Old Town, a statue was built of the young dragon, with his sword Blackfire pointed in the direction of Dorne. History remembers Daron as a hero. His sister, Dana the Defiant, idolized him. But author George R. R. Martin says that there is sometimes a fine line between madness and greatness, and that Daron I, the boy king who led a war of conquest, could also be considered mad if seen in a different light. He was a brave military leader, but he didn't care about the mass casualties of his men during an unnecessary war. He was only a teenager. So you could argue that grown adults, like his uncle Viserys and Alan Valerion, should have forbidden Daron from invading Dorne. But in reality, Daron's lords were just as bloodthirsty as he was. Alan Valerion helped Daron make his war plans. 
and the Reach constantly fought against Dorne over the centuries, so no doubt Lionel Tyrell wished to see Dorne conquered as well. The tale of the young dragon is a cautionary one. A king should check his impulses and set the safety of his people above all else, for that is what makes a good king, and Daron Targaryen was no good king. My next video in this series will cover Daron's brother, Baylor, who would become infamous for totally opposite reasons. Let me know in the comments your thoughts on the young dragon, and how well you think he might have ruled had he, you know, actually ruled instead of constantly violating Dorne. Thanks for watching and subscribing.